Thank you for your patience. The South Dakota Senate will come to order. Leading us in prayer today, I'm privileged to welcome back Reverend Mercy Hobbs from the Trinity Episcopal Church here in Pier, part of the Pier Fort Pier Ministerium to take care of us. And our page of the day is Hannah Jules from the great city of Belfouche leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance to our great nation's flag. Let us pray. God of compassion and courage, we thank you for giving us all who are gathered here today another day in which to love and serve you. You've commanded us to love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray, God, that the legislators of our state remember that all people are their neighbors created by you and that they are beloved and precious in your eyes. We pray for these men and women that have been elected, that they honor the promises they have made with grace, compassion, and integrity, remembering those who are in need in decisions that they make. Above all, God, fill each of them with your Holy Spirit, that they will be led by your vision and love, placing you first in all that they are and all that they do. To your honor and glory, amen. amen. of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Boland, Kamak, Cronin, Kurd, Ewing, Frerichs, Greenfield, Haverly, Heiner, Jensen, Kennedy, Killer, Klum, Colbeck, Langer, Mahar, Monroe, Nelson, Nesaba, Netherton, Northrop, Otten, Partridge, Peters, Rush, Russell, Sohol, Solano, Stalzer, Sutton, Tapio, Tiedemann, White, Wick, and Youngberg. We have a quorum, Mr. President. Approval of the journal, please. Mr. President, the Committee on Legislative Procedure respectfully reports that the Secretary of the Senate has had under consideration the Senate Journal of the 11th day. All errors, typographical or otherwise, are duly marked in the temporary journal for correction, and we hereby move the adoption of the report. Senator Greenfield, Chair. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carried.
We're going to pause right now. We have uh, quite a bit of business that we're going to work through, but I'd like to introduce some individuals who are here today and have them recognized. And also, thank you for watching uh, remotely for those who are tuned in for uh, your legislature and specifically the Senate. And thanks again to Paul and Public Broadcasting for do this. Uh, Dr. Jesse Barando, is that Barando? Oh, I was pretty good. Hua. We're glad that you're here, doctor. He's obviously, uh, our, we have, for the young people, we have doctors like Dr. Jesse here who's donating his time away from Mitchell, taking care of us, and uh, his partners uh, are all covering for him so that he can be up here, and they volunteer, and every day we have a medical, a physician here from the Medical Association. He's also uh, an Army officer who served uh, 11 years, in, in that capacity, and we're really grateful not only for your public service there uh, as a battalion surgeon in uh, Fort Lewis and other deployments. Uh, he's a specialist in adolescent and pediatric medicine, and is the only physician here that in adolescent medicine in South Dakota that we have a certification. He's a homie from uh, South Dakota and did his education here. And where'd you do your residency, doctor? In the Army, in, in Fort Lewis. Okay. Well, uh, he's at Mitchell at Avera Medical Group there, and I know that uh, you're very busy there, and especially now uh, with the H1 issues we've got, you're very, very busy. So thank you so much for the people of Mitchell loaning you to us and for your service, not only to our country, but right here, and welcome back home. Doctor, thanks. Senator Klum is one of the youngest that we have here. I think he still would fall in the adolescence area, so uh, not really. No, that's it. <laughs> that's it. We'd also like to welcome the rural Meade County students right here. Would you stand up? The eighth graders, if you've not been to rural Meade County, you are missing something. I love that place. Many different communities that are covered there, Opal, Union Center, Enning, uh, Adult schools, and uh, there are many others in that area. And where's your attendance center? So all three got together, and that's great. Well, on behalf of uh, Senator Kamak and me, because I do, I've been to all your cities. Okay, you might say, no, they're towns, but no, they're cities. And we have uh, Mrs. Uh, Urbanic, who's their teacher, and Heidi Comas, who's their uh, chaperone. Heidi, thank you, all of you, for being here. Good, good to see you, rural Meade County students. I'm just gonna guess because I can't see behind me, but it smells like Coogan, am I close? <laughs> that was great, I love all the Delmont group. If you've not been to Delmont, you are missing something. Please stand up. Delmont, we really thank you uh, for the Coogan and the Dakota Splash. Um, and we have the, when is the Delmont Coogan and Harvest Festival? Second weekend of September. And uh, we've got uh, many people up here, uh, including Frank, who we saw yesterday, Senator Frank, uh, who was uh, one of the original founders and sponsors of Delmont Day. And uh, we enjoyed the Happy Memories Band and all those individuals. Uh, I won't read off all their names. I think we know quite a bit of them, uh, uh, who they are and having visited with them. Especially want to thank you for our Coogan, our office uh, inhaled it and they have a bronchial tube obstruction from eating it so quickly. So thank you, Delmont. So when we were debating uh, Coogan as the state dessert, our son was in second grade, and so the students were all paying attention to bills, and this was one they were following, and I, I sent a message to them to follow this because it would be the state desert. And uh, the kids all got together since I misspelled it, and they wrote back that they would vote for the Sahara Desert as the state's favorite. So spelling, misspelling has consequences. We have uh, the South Dakota Ag Business Association. Great to be meeting with all of you today. Kathy Zander, Mr. President, 
all of these uh, young people in the leadership group that is just uh, embarking. Great questions today. Uh, these are leaders right now, and they're continuing to be that uh, within the agricultural world, but within their communities, they already are. So thank you very much for being here. <laughs> Senator Partridge wanted me to inform you to make sure that you bring your uh, tennis shoes for next Wednesday uh, for uh, the American Cancer Society, uh, Society Day uh, uh, sneaker weekend. Uh, sneaker day, so you wear your sneakers on a Wednesday, or you probably wear them any day, but that's uh, the identification day. No, 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 you can't. Okay, I won't tell you. Okay, any other personal privileges? Okay, for the students, we are running through just uh, a lot of business that we won't be paying attention to because it's all on the computer, but the Constitution requires us to do this in open session because individuals would be up here keeping track of what was going on with pencil and paper so that nothing would be hidden from them. Uh, we still have to do it verbally, orally, in front of everyone, but it's already in the computers. We will proceed now with reports of standing committees. Committee on Ag and Natural Resources reports that it has had under consideration House Bills 1015, 1035, 1037, 1046, and 1047, and recommends due pass to be placed on the consent calendar. Senator Kamak, Chair. Committee on Education has that under consideration. Senate Bill 78 recommends due pass. And Senate Bills 46 and 80 recommends due pass as amended. And Senate Bill 89 recommends due pass as amended and to be placed on consent. Senator Boland, Chair. Committee on Judiciary reports that it is had under consideration. Senate Bill 64 recommends due pass. And Senate Bill 61 and 87 recommend due pass as amended. Senator Russell, Chair. Committee on Commerce and Energy has had under consideration House Bill 1041 recommends due pass. House Bills 1030 and 1034 recommends due pass to be placed on the consent calendar and has deferred Senate Bill 101 to the 41st legislative day. Senator Jensen, Chair. And the Committee on Joint Appropriations has had under consideration Senate Bill 28, 45, 48, 49, and 50. 55, recommending due pass, Senator Tiedemann, and co-chair. And the Committee on Legislative Procedure respectfully reports that the Office of Engrossing and Enrolling has carefully compared Senate Bill 57 and finds the same correctly enrolled. Senator Greenfield, chair. So what our secretary was telling us is what the committees did with bills today. And again, if you want on the computer, you'll be able to see that in bills that you were following. Uh, next is messages. Mr. President, I have the honor to transmit Senate Bill 57, which has passed the House without change, and I have the honor to transmit House Bills 1005, 1032, 1033, 1051, 1079, and 1080, which have passed the House, and your favorable consideration is requested. Sandra J. Zinter, Chief Clerk. I want to pause now and, um, to assist uh, Senator Youngberg and Dakota State uh, that are coming next week uh, desiring a, a signing ceremony and a celebration on your vote. I'm going to uh, sign in open session the act you passed yesterday, an act to authorize the Board of Regents to uh, contract for the construction of the Madison Cyber Labs and the demolition of Lowry Hall at Dakota State University to make an appropriation, therefore, and to declare an emergency. That was uh, House Bill 1057. Okay, thank you very much for handling that team and getting that. Youngberg owes you big time. You can see him, see him look right there. Okay, motions and resolutions. Senator Nessipa moves that SCR 6 be deferred till Tuesday, January 30th, the 13th legislative day. All those in favor of deferral signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed nay, motion carry. The next item up is uh, dealing with a resolution that Senator Heiner is asking for everyone to consider here. A resolution doesn't have the force and effect of law, but if approved, would give the sentiment of the Senate relative to whatever the subject matter is of the resolution. This is uh, just a Senate resolution uh, asking only the Senate to join in that on behalf of Senator Heiner. Please proceed. Senate resolution. Resolution number one, a resolution confirming the legitimacy of and South Dakota's support for the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. 
Senator Heinert moves that SCR 1 is found on page 222 of the Senate Journal be adopted. Comments on that motion. Mataki P. How? Mataki P. Mr. President. Well, thank you. Members of the body, I, I really appreciate the time you are, you are affording me today. Um, hopefully you got a chance to, to read the resolution. Because uh, in the resolution itself, it, it takes language straight from the treaty. And this has been probably the, one of the crux of, of our issues with the federal government since 1868. 150 years ago, before tribes had formal governments and we were still governed by our Teoshpae and our headmen, we were able to sit down with the federal government and negotiate the terms of this treaty. I placed on your desk a map of the treaty lands, where it started. The second picture is how those lands were then either taken by force or removed from the roles as Indian lands. And then what we have today. I think you can see that those treaty obligations were not fulfilled by the federal government. Now, the Treaty of 1868 is probably the most important document to the tribes of South Dakota. Because it is our one document that when we go to the, federal to the federal government, we say Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution says that treaties are the law of the land. And you broke your promise to us. Now I think we here in South Dakota in the last few years have done great things as it deals with cooperation and learning about and understanding each other between the state of South Dakota and the tribes that are within its borders. I give credit to the governor and the lieutenant governor making tribal relations a cabinet level position. That's something that we never even thought was possible. The use of Lakota language by the lieutenant governor here on the Senate floor. That is a huge credit to our president. And it's a huge honor for us as Lakotas. So I'm not trying to make a political statement. I'm not trying to take the Black Hills back. That's not what this resolution asks. If you read it, the last paragraph, how we learn together, native and non-native, with forward-looking hopes and positive relationships full of respect. I think this is part of this journey. And if you were ever so kind to endorse this, this goes a long way. This goes a long way in acknowledging that we are still here. And we've come a long way as a people. We didn't have a formal government, not until the 30s. So this stuff is, is fairly new. So I, I appreciate your consideration. I hope you know that my community, myself, truly appreciate all you have shown us in my time here in the legislature. And hopefully we can keep this going forward and keep this dialogue open and keep working together, native, non-native, for the good of South Dakota. I'll stand by for any questions. Pilamia Apolo. Pilamia. Senator Killer. How? Thank you, Mr. President and members of the body. And, I'll, and I won't you know, reiterate what, what, what was said, but just to kind of give you a more modern update, uh, especially from um, some of our, our members' generation. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about was specifically President Nixon 
And President Nixon was actually really um, instrumental in introducing the concept of self-determination, you know, and that in really figuring out, well, what does local government mean for tribal communities? And how do we introduce the concept of self-determination, local control, all that kind of stuff? And so that's kind of where a lot of these BIA 638 programs come from, you know, where tribes can actually implement their own police force, their own governance, all that kind of stuff around that premise that was promised in the treaty. And I really do appreciate, uh, you know, that was like one of the best things that President Nixon's ever done for a lot of Native communities. And, you know, and I think to reiterate Senator Heinert's point is that, you know, this has been one of the most instrumental and learning phases for a lot of us um, about how do we, you know, mesh several different governments, but also how do we learn from that? But how do, how do we advocate that wholly, you know, Republican, Democrat, um, conservative, you know, liberal, whatever, how do you want to call it? It's, it's not the issue of that. It's just sticking up for our South Dakotans, you know, and, and granted, yeah, this was signed 150 years ago, but, you know, according to the U.S. Constitution, it's still the supreme law of land under Article 6. And so I just want to, you know, really, um, you know, stand up and support this. And I do appreciate, you know, everyone reading through this and understanding that history because this is, you know, as a state, this is, this is you know, one of the complexities of what we are today. And, but it's also as legislators, that's the complexities of what we deal with, you know, of learning about different governance. And it's also uniquely um, historical to our state. So I really, you know, take pride in all that. I take pride in the fact that, you know, as like we've all been able to learn over the past, you know, I've been in office for 10 years now, and this has been one of the best experiences of my life, but also to see how South Dakotan government has adapted in learning and even advocating for better IHS um, solutions. And that's the, one of the biggest things that I think that a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, a lot of the members of this body want better governance for IHS from this perspective. And I do appreciate all of you for, for doing that. So thank you, Mr. President, members of the body, and I will also stand by for questioning. Pelamia. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate then is uh, Senator Heinert's motion that Senate Resolution 1 be uh, adopted. Those in favor of adoption will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? No. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Plum? No. Colbeck? No. Langer? Aye. Maher? Aye. Monroe? No. Nelson? Aye. Nessaba? Netherton is excused. Nordstrup is excused. Otten. Aye. Partridge? No. Peters? Excused. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? No. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Wick Aye. and Youngberg. Aye. Mr. President, there are 25 yeas, 7 nays, and 3 excused. Senator Heinert's motion that Senate Resolution 1 be adopted, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed, and SR1 is so adopted. Senate Concurrent Re Resolution Number 7, a concurrent resolution supporting the State of Israel. President Pro Tem has uh, waived the committee referral of SCR 7. It'll be placed on the committee for tomorrow. His, uh, our ag folks are leaving. Thank you. I also noticed our friends here last night and other people from AgFest. Um, I certainly ate a lot of pig wings, so I just I love it. Uh, look at me. I like to eat, and actually Senator Tiedemann was a great push. Thank you so much for last night, sir. Senator Kurd moves that Senate Bill 84 be deferred till Wednesday, January 31st, the 14th legislative day. Who did that? Maher? Okay, sorry. 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed nay. Motion carried. Okay, consideration of committee reports, please. Senator Kurd moves that the reports of the Standing Committee on Health and Human Services on Senate Bill 105 of the Senate Journal be adopted. All those in favor of adoption signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed nay. Motion carried. Okay, first reading of Senate bills. Uh, we need to read these in open session. There we go. Again, uh, for the students, there were people sitting up there making sure where bills, their names, their numbers, and where they were assigned. Again, this is already in the computer, but we have to comply with the Constitution, so it has to be read in open session. You'll see our team up here will be reading them at the same time, and we will uh, be ignoring them, much like my childhood with my mother. Senate Bill 151. An act to revise certain provisions regarding the sale of trailers at special events and declare an emergency. 152, an act to revise certain provisions relating to the sale and possession of tobacco products. 153, an act to require disclosure of certain fees being imposed by overnight lodging accommodations. Senate Bill 163, an act to require certain reports in the event of an oil spill. 169, an act to revise certain provisions regarding the licensing of malt beverage manufacturers and microbreweries. Senate Bill 173, an act to authorize malt beverage manufacturers to transfer a certain amount of product to certain retail facilities. 172, an act to provide for an opt-out by certain professions from the temporary licensing compact. Senate Joint Resolution Number 4, a joint resolution proposing and submitting to the voters at the next general election a new section to Article 12 of the Constitution of the State of South Dakota relating to the creation and administration of a trust fund with the net receipts from certain unclaimed property. Senate Joint Resolution Number 5, a joint resolution proposing and submitting to the voters an amendment to the Constitution of the State of South Dakota regarding the maximum annual change in general fund appropriations. Senate Joint Resolution Number 6, a joint resolution to provide for the appointment process for the Secretary of the Department of Tribal Relations. Senate Joint Resolution Number 7, a joint resolution rescinding House Joint Resolution 1001 adopted by the 90th Legislature of the State of South Dakota. Senate Bill Number 154, an act to revise certain provisions concerning the transfer of motor vehicle titles to satisfy unpaid motor vehicle repair bills. Senate Bill 158, an act to require certain transfers of funds from the State Highway Fund to the Local Bridge Improvement Grant Fund. Senate Bill 166, an act to revise certain provisions relating to moisture and protein content devices and the fee that may be charged for such devices. And finally, Senate Bill 170, an act to direct the implementation of the requirements of certain provisions regarding non-meandered waters. First of all, I'd like to announce that uh, Senate Bill 107 has been withdrawn in accordance with Joint Rule 6 Bravo TAC 1.1. So that's uh, Senate Bill 107 has been withdrawn. President Pro Tem Greenfield's made the following assignments to the respective committees. Senate Bill 156, 157, 166, and 170 to Ag and Natural Resources. Commerce will hear 151, 152, 153, 163, 169. Education, 160, 162. Health and Human Services, 164. Judiciary, 155, 161, 165, 167, 168. Local Government, 158. State Affairs, 172, 173, and SJRs 4, 5, 6, and 7, Taxation 150, 159, and 171, and Transportation 154. Hold your cards, we have a bingo. Okay, first reading of House Bill, same drill. House Bill 1005, an act to revise certain requirements for a recitation regarding the effect of a vote on certain ballot measures. 1032, an act to exempt credit unions from the requirements to be licensed as real estate brokers. 1033, an act to revise certain licensing renewal procedures for business insurance producers. 1051, an act to revise certain provisions regarding suspension or debarment of a business by the Bureau of Administration. House Bill 1079, an act to authorize certain physical therapists to perform dry needling as a treatment technique. And finally, 1080, an act to revise certain requirements to qualify for emblem specialty plates for motor vehicles. These are House bills that have passed the House, have come over for assignment, and the following committees will hear these bills. Commerce will hear 1032, 1033, and 1051, Health and Human Services 1079, State Affairs 1005, and Transportation 1080. 
Next up, we have our consent calendar. These are bills that have come out of committee that were non-controversial. They passed unanimously, only require a majority vote for passage. And from an efficiency perspective, we have four of them. We vote on them at the same time, and there's no debate. Questions may be asked, but if somebody wishes to debate one of the bills, it can remove it, and on Tuesday it would be debated. I don't see anyone requesting removal, so we'll go forward with our consent calendar items, please. Senate Bill 90, an act to revise certain provisions regarding the payment of taxes and fees before transferring title of mobile homes and manufactured homes. Senate Bill 86, an act to revise certain requirements when a local unit of government sells surplus property through a real estate broker. House Bill 1011, an act to revise certain provisions regarding voter registration list maintenance mailings. And finally, House Bill 1020, an act to revise certain provisions and regulations regarding medical assistance. House Bill 1011 and 1020 and Senate Bills 90 and, 90, and excuse me, and 86, having received a second reading, are up for consideration and final passage. Senators, do you have any questions on any of these bills? Hearing none, the question for the Senate's final passage of House Bill 1011 and 1020, Senate Bills 90 and 86. Those in favor of passage will vote aye. Those opposed, nay. Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? Aye. Netherton? Excused. Nordstrup? Excused. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Peters, Rush, Aye. Russell, Aye. Soholt, Aye. Solano, Aye. Stalzer, Aye. Sutton, Aye. Tapio, Aye. Tiedemann, Aye. White, Aye. Wick, Aye. and Youngberg. Aye. Mr. President, there are 32 yeas, three excused. House Bills 1011 and 1020 and Senate Bill 90 and 86 having received a majority vote of the members elect are all hereby declared passed. Any title questions? I'll approve the titles then, thank you. Okay, now we're on to our debate calendar. Second reading of Senate bills, please. Senate Bill 62, an act to provide for the notification related to a breach of certain data and to provide a penalty therefor. Thank you, Senate Bill 62, having received a second reading is up for consideration and final passage. Senator Russell, good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. <clears throat> Senate Bill 62 comes to you at the request of the Attorney General. He had um, discovered recently through a number of uh, data breaches regarding specifically Equifax and Target that uh, South Dakotans financial information had been breached and there had not been a disclosure to the consumers of the state. Um, during the process of investigating the situation, they realized in the Attorney General's office that we had inadequate tools under South Dakota law to deal with these types of situations. So he brought this bill in order to have the ability, uh, the requirement on the companies to disclose this information to their consumers and or the Attorney General's office under certain time frames that are, that are outlined in the bill. And if there is a knowingly, uh, a knowing effort on the part of any of these type of agencies after such a breach, not to disclose this information to their customers and the attorney generals pursuant to the, stat the statute that you have in front of you, that the attorney general would have certain options, both civil and criminal, to make sure that there would not be these types of breaches and to make sure that the public of South Dakota is protected. It's my understanding that there will be a friendly amendment offered by one of our uh, esteemed colleagues from Rapid City. I have uh, conferred with the Attorney General's office on the amendment. They like the amendment and would welcome it as such. So I would encourage both your approval of the amendment and approval of the bill. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Russell, very much. Senator Solano, good afternoon, sir. And I note that uh, you have up here an amendment marked 62, Charlie Alpha, is that correct? That, that's correct, Mr. Do you President. move it at this time? I, I do move it. 
comments on the motion to amend? Do you wish uh, latitude to speak to the bill as well? Uh, um, I'll stick just to the amendment and, aye, aye. and then allow Please that proceed. to, to yep. go. So thank you, Mr. President. And, and first, let me um, give gratitude to the Attorney General's office um, as, as this has been formulating and, and hearing from the healthcare, uh, some of the healthcare providers' concern as it related to um, federal statute that also uh, has certain requirements as it relates to data breaches. And probably the most notable one, of course, would be HIPAA. So the amendment that, that is there um, is, if, if you're on page six of the bill, it's within section eight, is just simply removing uh, where it says maintain procedures when a breach of system security occurs and inserting, um, it, inserting provisions of the applicable federal law or regulation. And the healthcare folks just feel like that's, again, making it a little clearer for them that it's federal regulation that they'll be required to comply with if there's a breach that's covered under the federal law. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Further remarks on the Solano motion to amend? Hearing none, all those in favor of Senator Solano's motion to amend marked 62. Charlie Alpha signify by saying aye. Was opposed nay. Motion carried. 62 is so amended. Further remarks on Senate Bill 62 is amended. Hearing none, the question, excuse me, Senator Partridge. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a question for the sponsor, if State I could. State your question, please. Thank you. Um, I understand this bill as it relates to maybe a larger organization like Target or large retail outfits, but I guess my concern or question has to do with small business. What type of impact may the failure to disclose or the whatever the regulations are that are in this bill have have on small business especially in in the you know west river we have a lot of tourism business so i mean you have a lot of retail that's just really mom and pop um, i'm wondering if you could address that please senator russell do you wish to answer the question sir i do it's generally applicable however it is geared more towards your larger uh, entities and there are specific provisions that call for in excess of 250 people that would be um, their information disclosed. So yes, it will have a small business impact as, it as well it should. Senator Partridge, you have the floor, sir. Okay. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate is final passage of Senate Bill 62 as amended. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Burricks? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Pardon? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? No. Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Plum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nessaba? Aye. Netherton? Otten? Aye. Partridge? No. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Sohold? No. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 30 yeas, two nays, and three excused. Thank you, ma'am. Senate Bill 62, as amended, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any title? Questions? Titles approved, then. Thank you. Senate Bill 19, an act to revise certain provisions regarding lease purchase agreements for a local education agency. Senate Bill 19, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Senator Solano, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate being back. Excellent. Uh, so Senate Bill 19 um, was a bill brought at the request of the Health and Education Facilities Administration and the Board of Technical Education. And uh, last year, we had Senate Bill 65, which created the Board of Technical Education. And within that bill, we, it included language that transferred lease purchase 
and bonding authority to the new board for buildings on the tech school campuses. Well, there was some errors in that drafting language from last year, so this bill fixes a drafting error uh, as it relates to the um, transferring bonding and lease purchase authority. Uh, it's clarifying that the lease purchase agreements entered into the Board of Technical Institutes are not limited to 30 years, and that bonds relating to the Technical Institutes are all attached to a master lease purchase agreement that uh, has been in place for over 20 years and will remain in place for the rest of the life of the bonds, uh, which will be decades to come. So uh, we're fixing uh, some things that, that we were able to create the Technical Institute Boards last year, giving them the authority for bonding and just making uh, that fix uh, uh, to the statute that, that we created last year. Thank you, Mr. President. Well done, thank you, sir. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate is final passage of Senate Bill 19. Those in favor will vote aye, those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Maher? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? Yes, excuse me. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 32 yeas and three excused. Senate Bill 19, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any title questions? Titles approved then. Thank you. Thank you. Senate Bill 94, an act to establish certain provisions regarding the Opportunity Scholarship Program. Senate Bill 94, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Good afternoon, Senator Kolbeck. I note you have an amendment here. Um, do you wish to move it at this time and speak to that on the bill? Thank you, Mr. President and members of the Senate. Yes, I have amendment 94JB okay. that I would like to have uh, amended to this bill. Okay. At this time. Comments on the motion to amend, and I'll grant you the latitude to speak to the amendment as well as the bill, sir. You could speak to both before we adopt. And I would uh, prefer to speak to the amendment, please. Okay. Please go ahead and speak to the okay. amendment. Uh, when this bill was drafted on line two, page two, line three, um, the words that meets the course requirement of 135531. Those were supposed to have been scratched. Um, I'll take the blame for not uh, reading that uh, when I've got that back from uh, the LRC. That is, uh, needs to be changed. All 1355-31 is the requirements uh, that are listed in the original bill uh, for their coursework study uh, in this uh, Opportune Scholarship Bill. Thank you, and I appreciate your support. Do you wish to speak to the bill too or just put the amendment on and we'll go? Mr. President, uh, just the amendment right okay. now. Okay. Further remarks on the motion to amend. Senator Sutton, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Question of the sponsor. Thank you, Senator, uh, excuse me, please proceed to read the question, Senator Sutton. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator, when, when we strike that uh, reference to 135531, within that, statute in what looks like subdivision three it talks about meeting high school course requirements for graduation as provided in 13-55-31.1 and i don't see that in the bill that that portion of the high school requirements for graduation so can you can you explain that to me senator kolbeck do you wish to answer the question yes thank you senator sutton uh, that was an administrative rule that was placed in that by the Board of Regents. 
back in the year 04 as we believe it was put in there. Senator Sutton, you have the floor. I want to take another shot at the question. Yeah, so I, I will try that again. Uh, in in 13-55-31, which is the piece that we are striking, there are uh, five subsections, and, and subsection three states, in order to qualify for the Opportunity Scholarship, they must meet the high school course requirements for graduation as provided in 1355-31.1. So by removing 13-35-31 from the language of this bill, uh, we are essentially cutting out the same requirements that every other student has to meet. Senator Colbeck, do you wish to answer the question? Yep, thank you. Uh, Senator Sutton, and I, like I stated before, that is an administrative rule that the Board of Regents to put in there, and they can strike that administrative rule at any time that they want to do that. That does not take uh, legislation to do that. They can strike that requirement um, at any meeting or tomorrow if they would like to do that. What we are doing is trying to, or what we're doing here is getting the requirements as the original bill was written, written, the requirements for the home schools, the course requirements, the same as the institutional, private, and public school students. That's the reason why we were striking 1355, and in the bill that you have in front of you, Senate Bill 94, you will see that the transcripts uh, provide a transcript of completed coursework issued by the parent or guardian listed on the certificate of excuse includes, striking those words, those requirements that are also required of the public and private school students uh, at this time. Okay, thank you. Senator Sutton, I think for, for everybody's assistance, as you look at the bill and you look at the amendment, uh, Senator Kobeck, you're desiring to just get rid of that reference so that the certificate of excuse, if this amendment goes on, um, would specifically delineate what's in the bill, but not cross-reference 1355-31. Is, is that correct? Senator Sutton, is that? You have the floor, so I was just well, trying to jump in the pool here. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and, and I would just contend that, um, and thank you for the good senator for, for uh, trying to clarify for me, but um, I, I would simply respectfully disagree that we're talking about administrative rule because this is actually in statute within 1355-31, and I think that is a bit uh, problematic with uh, removing that language if we're trying to keep students the same on the same playing field. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Further remarks on the motion to amend? Hearing none, the question before the Senate is Senator Colbeck's motion to amend marked a 94 Juliet Bravo. Those in favor of that amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed nay? No. Motion carried. It is so amended. Further remarks, Senate Bill 94 as amended. Senator Colbeck? Nope. Further remarks. Uh, Senator Kennedy, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President. Question of the prime sponsor. State your question, sir. I am reviewing section three on page two of Senate Bill 94 and am comparing it to the provisions of SDCL 13-35-31.1, uh, specifically, Subparagraphs six and I, I don't know if there's another one, but six for sure. And I'm wondering if that is an intentional omission uh, in Senate Bill 94 of the requirements of 1335-31.1. Senator Colbeck, do you care to answer the question? Uh, Senator, I, I would uh, appreciate, Senator Kennedy, if you would repeat that 
for me, please? You know, um, I think it'll be easier to be unconventional, um, and we'll be at ease. Senator Kobach, why don't you go back and look at the statute, the, and Senator Kennedy will show it to you, and we'll just be at ease for a couple of minutes. Uh, I think that'll be the most efficient since he's cross-referencing a statute. So while we're waiting, uh, we'll be playing some music from Mannheim Steamroller. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, we're coming back again. Thank you, Mr. President. I, uh, I apologize to the body no uh, that I did not understand the question correctly, but I did go back there, and that uh, section or that line uh, that Senator Kennedy was referring to was not, and I'll repeat, not intentionally deleted. Um, that would have probably been another oversight on my part, and, but it was not intentionally deleted from that section. Thank you. So, Senator Kennedy, do you? Well, uh, I guess I would follow up with another question then. Senator, do you intend to offer an amendment to Senate Bill uh, 94 to incorporate that into your draft? And if so, do you want to defer this until you have a chance to put your amendment together? I will uh, honor that request, and I'll defer this till Tuesday until that amendment is placed in that. Well, Thank you. Senator Greenfield. If I could do that. Thank you, Mr. President. At least for the time being, I would move that the, the uh, Senate That's Bill 94 be deferred and placed on the calendar to follow House Bill 1040. That's great. That's Thank a great you. suggestion. Uh, why, why Senator Greenfield's doing that, Senator Colbeck, is so we can get our team member up from LRC right here to assist you with that right now. That's why they're so good to be right here. Uh, I didn't mean Fred as the good teammate. Uh, just for clarity for those who are listening, Fred's just coming in acting like he's doing work. Uh, but this way, don't go to Fred. No, you want to get this done. Go over there. Uh, but uh, we'll get work on that amendment and then take it up after uh, the House Bill 1040. All those in favor of that motion to move this to the end of the calendar signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. Thank you. Senator Greenfield for reading my mind. It's kind of a frightening place, but you were there. Here you go, Jill. Okay, uh, last Senate will be SJR2. Senate Joint Resolution Number 2, a joint resolution proposing and, and submitting to the electors at the next general election an amendment to the Constitution of the State of South Dakota relating to the militia of the state. Thank you. Senate Joint Resolution 2, having received second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Good afternoon, Senator Nelson. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. Today I bring before you a common sense correction to our state constitution. This is obviously a proposal to present to the uh, voters of South Dakota the opportunity to bring our our state constitution into the current century. 
what this does is it takes away the gender reference to the statute, or excuse me, in the Constitution, and also takes off the age limit of, of 45. Now, this is, uh, there's nothing nefarious about this. This is a, a good way of cleaning up our, our Constitution, and more importantly, uh, with a head nod towards uh, enforcing and supporting the Second Amendment rights of the South Dakotans that will be affected. So all this does is it offers to the electorate the opportunity to take out the gender of just male and make it male or female. The reason for this is in this modern day world, we've got thousands of very capable women that are serving in our military. Uh, matter of fact, my beautiful middle daughter, Maggie, is a BM2 on the USS Blue Ridge in Yokosuka, Japan right now. Go Navy. Hoorah. So this is also a head nod to all the service members that I had the privilege of serving with uh, when I was in the Marines. And uh, uh, when, I, when I found this in statute, it was as a result of defending some pro-Second Amendment bills uh, that were here in the legislature last year. When I saw this, I cringed and realized that this, in fact, lessened the Second Amendment rights of South Dakotans. Uh, I know there's quite a, few, quite a few folks in here that share my age uh, approximity uh, to being over the age of 45. So this is also a gesture of respect to you that we are still capable of, uh, if we are in need of being called up for our state, that we can also serve in, in a capacity uh, as prescribed by statute in, the, in South Dakota codified law. So I will stand by for some questions and uh, I, I'd ask you to please support this and allow the voters to bring our, our constitution into uh, this current century. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Good afternoon, Senator Stalzer. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to offer a verbal amendment. Okay. On line 13 of the uh, resolution, where it strikes persons, puts person, I would like to insert the word legally residing in the state. So just adding a one word uh, to make it a legal resident. Here's the read back, uh, Senator Stalls are on line 13. Uh, excuse me. Page one, line 13 of SJR2, after the word person, insert the word legally. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, there's a second. Comments on the motion to amend? Uh, I just believe it's pretty self-explanatory, and since the prime sponsor piped up with a second, I assume it's a friendly amendment. Further remarks on the amendment proposed? All those in favor of the motion to amend signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. Motion carried. SJR 2 is so amended. Further remarks on SJR 2 as amended? Senator Rush, good afternoon, sir. 
Mr. President, and I, I'm, I'm not speaking against my good friend from, from Hanson County's uh, here uh, proposal in this case. What I do want to point out is that this is a prime example of things that should not be in our Constitution. Our Constitution should be the fundamental law of the land. It shouldn't contain stuff such as age requirements for someone to serve in the National Guard. And I, there's nothing that our body is doing about this now, but I just want to, to point out, you know, this is why our Constitution goes on for many pages. You know, compare the kind of things that we have in our Constitution compared to the United States Constitution. You know, if it was in our laws, uh, Senator Nelson wouldn't have to bring a proposed constitutional amendment, we could just change it. And that's why I just want to, put, you know, these are not the kind of things that ought to be in our Constitution. Constitution. Thank you, Senator. For clarity, uh, for people who are listening, this uh, has no relevance to the National Guard. This is the militia. Um, further remarks? Uh, Senator Bowen, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. And I'd just like to, uh, again, point out an uh, important vote. Anytime you put one of these, uh, I said this yesterday, say it again today, put one of these on the ballot, it's a it's probably a more important vote than just the statute. The other thing, too, is that let's keep in mind as well, uh, this is a part of the Constitution, not a part of statute. The statutes are based on the Constitution, which is the fundamental political document of the state. So I'd just like to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Nelson, do you want to give a quick close? Very quickly, sir, I need to get home before all my stuff's out in front of the house on fire. Aye, so aye. Uh, I, I definitely appreciate uh, the support and the comments. You know, there was some comments were made during the committee that may the, the public may even still have some questions about this. Uh, folks asked, uh, you know, people were confused. They didn't realize we even had a state militia. And what is the purpose of a state militia? And it, can it be just a bunch of group of guys throwing some, uh, some old camouflage utilities on and declare themselves a militia? Uh, to that, I can tell you that no, that is not the case. Uh, South Dakota does have in statute specific uh, criteria and codified law dealing with the official South Dakota State Militia, and that's in Chapter 33-2, and there's specific guidelines on uh, the construct of the militia, who's in charge, who, uh, who's uh, in, involved in it, and also provides for conscientious obje uh, objections, or excuse me, conscientious uh, objectors that do not want to serve in the capacity of carrying a firearm. So we do have a organized militia structure. It is not something that's just ad hoc and thrown together. There is a rank and file structure to it and a, uh, a hierarchy, which is important in any type of military or paramilitary organization. Now, why do we need a militia? Well, good Lord will, and, and I hope we pray we never need the militia to be called up because if the South Dakota militia is called up, that means that the, our federal standing army and our National Guard and other reserves are in dire straits and that this state is in itself in very grave danger. Now, we have been very fortunate in the history of our country where the only invasions that we suffered, the only casualties, the major casualties we suffered on, on our American soil was during the Civil War. But my point to that is, during the Civil War, the militias that were called up were instrumental in defeating the attacks on uh, the United States for the advancement and the expansion of slavery. So uh, we have the militia to be thankful for in being able to provide us with a free nation. Uh, the militia goes back to the founding of this country. As most of you know, it is, is written into the very fabric of our U.S. Constitution in the Second Amendment. And what this does, this change, does in fact strengthen uh, the Second Amendment rights of South Dakotans if this in fact is passed by South Dakotans uh, at, at, if it makes it on the ballot. So I definitely appreciate uh, the support and uh, let's go ahead and get this passed out of the Senate over the House and allow South Dakotans to update their state constitution. Thank you, folks. Further remarks? Hearing no further remarks, the question before the Senate is final passage of Senate Joint Resolution 2. Those in favor, will vote, excuse me, as amended. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Senator Boland. Aye. Kamak. Aye. Cronin. Aye. 
Curd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Prairies? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? No. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? No. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? No. Netherton? Excused. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Sohold? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 29 yeas, 3 nays, and 3 excused. Senate Joint Resolution 2, uh, as amended, having received majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Okay, we're on to uh, second reading of, <clears throat> excuse me, House Bills debate calendar and the House Bills. Please proceed. House Bill 1069, an act to establish an unladen motor vehicle permit for certain proportionally registered commercial motor vehicles. Peace be with you. House Bill 1069, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Senator Stalzer, good afternoon again, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this bill is brought to us by the uh, Department of Transportation Public. Uh, South Dakota is a part of an international registration plan for proportional uh, payment of fees for vehicles that travel in multiple states. Um, it's all reported and then it goes into the fund and comes back to South Dakota for miles that are driven in our state. Uh, during an audit of this program last year, they discovered that we are out of compliance and in this, this isn't like we're out of compliance with the federal regulation where they're going to take away our highway funds. It's just a, an agreement among states and some of the Canadian provinces uh, that we will share the, uh, the registration fees. Um, so the bill is brought to allow a trucker who has a vehicle where his lease has expired while he's in the state of South Dakota to apply for a temporary registration so that he can move his unloaded vehicle to search for another lease or leave the state to return home. Uh, it gives him 30 days to do that. The cost is $25. I will assume that the uh, president will say that requires a two-thirds vote. Um, I'll remind him to make that. Uh, but. Anyway, it, it does then also allow him to travel across other state lines to go home. So it's uh, basically just a, a provision to allow a trucker who's got a problem to legally get out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate is final passage of a House Bill 1069. And uh, Senator Stalzer, of course, is correct. It's uh, not, not the fee that results in it being in two-thirds as it goes into the highway sub-fund that's distributed outside of your general bill authorities. So it requires a two-thirds majority vote for passage. Those in favor of passage of House Bill 1069 will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Boland? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Curd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? Excused. Rush? Aye. Russell? Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. 
Youngberg? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Mr. President, there are 32, ye 32 yeas, three excused. Senate bill, excuse me, House Bill 1069, having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. And I'll approve the title. House Bill 1013, an act to revise certain provisions regarding voting systems used in elections and to declare an emergency. House Bill 1013, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Are there any remarks? Senator Kamak, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Senate Bill 1013 ensures the integrity and security of our paper ballot system. This bill repeals the language that allowed for direct recording electronic devices and clarifies that no automatic tabulation, tabulating or electronic ballot marking devices or election voting equipment system may be connected to the internet. No ballot marking device may, be, may save or tabulate votes marked on any system. The option to certify or use the direct recording electronic devices is also repealed. In 2005, uh, we, we approved that auditors could order direct recording electronic devices. To date, however, no county has purchased or used these devices. And again, this ensures the integrity and security of our paper ballots. I would ask for your support. Thank you for the remarks. Hearing none, the question for the Senate is uh, final passage of House Bill 1013. It has an emergency clause, requires a two-thirds majority vote for passage. Those in favor of passage will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak. Aye. Cronin. Aye. Kurd. Aye. Ewing. Aye. Frerichs. Aye. Greenfield. Aye. Haverly. Aye. Heinert. Aye. Jensen. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Killer. Plum, Aye. Kobeck, Aye. Langer, Aye. Mahar, Aye. Monroe, Aye. Nelson, Aye. Nesaba, Aye. Netherton, excused, Otten, Aye. Partridge, Aye. Rush, Aye. Russell, Aye. Soholt, Aye. Solano, Aye. Stalzer, Aye. Sutton, Aye. Tapio, Tiedemann, Aye. White, Aye. Wick, Aye. Youngberg. Aye. Mr. President, 32 yeas, 3 excused. Thank you. House Bill 1013, having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any title questions? I'll approve the title then. Next up. House Bill 1001, an act to revise the membership of the Executive Board of the Legislative Research Council. House Bill 1001, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Senator Greenfield, welcome back, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the body, I would like to speak briefly to uh, House Bill 1001 because it has come through the executive board process and um, has been something that a number of us have, have actually uh, taken a look at already. I do know that uh, I've, I've heard of some concerns and I will stand by to address anything that is brought up here on the floor, but. I'd like to take you back to a meeting that we ha had back in March um, after the last day of, of the session last year. We were discussing something that was of particular importance and I looked around the room and I noticed that the speaker pro tem was not in the room. I had a little sidebar conversation with the executive director of LRC and the speaker of the house and I said I felt that it was appropriate that the speaker pro tem be there after which they they agreed and I went and found the speaker pro tem the fact of the matter is the speaker pro tem by virtue of his or her position is not on the executive board we felt that that may be something we would like to uh, include them in going forward particularly because the chair of the executive board in odd numbered years, the first year of a person's two year term is the speaker of the house. So if the speaker pro tem is brought into the process and if the speaker pro tem does in fact survive the caucus elections, that person would be the speaker going forward and the chair of the executive board. 
So we're asking that the language be inserted that in addition, the Speaker Pro Tem of the House shall serve ex officio as a non-voting member if the Speaker Pro Tem of the House is not already a voting member by right of caucus election or vacancy succession. It's a very simple bill and intended to be uh, as, as much and as such. There was no nefarious intent and um, I, guess, I guess I will address a concern that was raised is does this affect the balance of power between the House and Senate? I would say no. I would say this is a good government provision that simply se seeks to strengthen the legislative body as a whole by providing that somebody who will be involved in the process very intimately would be involved in the process a little bit earlier. So with that, I would stand by for questions and I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before Senator Partridge. Well, thank you, Mr. President. I am a member of the executive board and I would ask that you not support this. The uh, balance of power um, issue raised by the good senator from Brown County is the one that I raised and it is in question for me. Allowing the speaker pro tem to participate in the meeting, I realize not vote, but they can, with an ex officio status, you can talk, you can, you know, offer ideas, you can be part of the meeting, just not vote. And I just think that's the wrong um, message that we send for the folks that put this e-board together. You know, we've spent a lot of time over the years on figuring out what's the right balance, who should be part of the e-board, things of that nature. And I would say that the speaker pro tem has the right to go to the meeting, be there, already can do that, learn how the process works, but being up at the dais and being part of the e-board would not be something that I think that we should grant the House. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Klum, good question afternoon. For the prime sponsor. Question for the prime sponsor? Yes, state your question. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Senator, in the case of an executive session, would the, the, the ex officio member be asked to leave or would he be allowed to stay? Senator Greenfield, do you care to answer the question? Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for the question. I believe that that would be subject to the determination of the body, quite frankly. And I do know that last year, um, in particular, when we were having our a discussion in executive session, the speaker pro tem was part of that discussion. Um, but it was the decision of the broader executive board to allow for that. Thank you. I would just point out that uh, it's traditional ex officio is still part of the part of the board and would be under most rulings, uh, be part of uh, executive sessions. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate is a final passage of House Bill 1001. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? No. Kurd? No. Ewing? Frerichs? No. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? No. Heinert? No. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? No. Killer? No. Plum? Aye. Kolbeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? No. Netherton is excused. Otten? No. Partridge? No. Rush? No. Russell? Aye. Soholt? No. Solano? No. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? No. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? White? No. Wick? Aye. Pardon? Aye. Youngberg? No. Mr. President, there are 14 <laughs> yeas, 18 nays, and three excused. House Bill, what? House Bill 1001, having failed to receive a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared lost.
House Bill 1003, an act to revise certain provisions concerning the content of the campaign finance disclosure reports and to declare an emergency. House Bill 1003, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Safe travels today, Senator Kennedy, back to your great home. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I hope I can get up the driveway. Uh, House Bill 1003 comes from the Government Accountability Task Force. It's a bipartisan bill that was put together at the request of the Secretary of State's office. And the reason for the bill is that when the legislature last year passed Senate Bill 54, which authorized campaign contributions from entities, there was an oversight. We failed to also require that campaign contributions from entities be reported on the financial, campaign financial disclosure forms. So what Senate, or House Bill 1003 does is it requires that any entity contribution received after July 1 of 2017 be reported on the financial disclosure form, and that's the only amendment to the existing provisions of SDCL 12-27-24 and the amendment appears on page two of the printed bill on line 16. Um, it also, uh, House Bill 1003 also incorporates an emergency clause because the intent is to make this law applicable to this election cycle. Uh, the bill cleared the House of Representatives unanimously. It cleared uh, uh, Senate State Affairs unanimously, and I would urge this body's support. I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate is final passage of House Bill 1003. As Senator Kennedy pointed out, it does have an emergency clause, therefore requires two-thirds vote for passage. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin? Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Sohold? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Papio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wink? Aye. Youngberg? Mr. President, there are 32 yeas, three excused. House Bill 1003, having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. I'll approve the title as well. Senate Bill 1006. An act to revise the extent of comments required by the Director of the Legislative Research Council regarding certain ballot issues and the period of time in which those comments are to be made. House Bill 1006, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Senator Bowlen, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. President. I bring, you, I bring to you today uh, House Bill 1006. Uh, this is a bill that came from the task force that met this summer. It was passed unanimously uh, by all the members. Just like to point out there are two or three things in this bill uh, that I would like to definitely point out to you. First of all, what this bill does, as the title indicates, the director's written comments under this section shall include assistance regarding the substantive content of the initiated measure or initiated amendment uh, in order to minimize any conflict conflict with existing law and to ensure the measure's amendment effective administration. Of course, right now, the LRC is only allowed to give style and form comments. This will allow the LRC to give substantive comments 
to the individuals who want to bring these particular measures to have them placed on the ballot. I believe that is a very valid and positive change that we can bring to the initiated process. Secondly, I would like to point out the language in the, in the bill that says the sponsors may but are not required to amend the initiated measure or initiated amendment to the Constitution to comply with the director's comments. There is no requirement that any of these substantive comments, substantive changes that are recommended must be uh, complied with. The uh, new section of the bill basically says is that the, uh, the director of the LRC has, uh, is, is not required but can uh, meet these requirements during the time from the 1st of December until uh, the end of the legislation, legislative session, again, inclusive, the director shall provide written comments as required pursuant to 12-13-25, not more than 15 working days following the adjournment sine die of the legislative session. Now, I know there's been a number of concerns raised about this. Uh, again, I want to emphasize we have every empirical uh, data, all the information we have is that the LRC meets these requirements in a very effective uh, in effective manner. Uh, we have a very small but effective LRC. It's a nonpartisan group. They have been very adept throughout their history, and we have no reason to believe that this portion of the bill will in any way uh, affect the ability of uh, groups to get their measures on the ballot. Um, I would also like to point out that Senate Bill 11, which we have passed through this particular uh, portion of the legislative process allows for the extension of these comments to begin much earlier. So uh, I would urge you to support this bill as it is written, as it came from the task force. And I want to thank you very much. Uh, we'll be here probably listening to a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have Senator Sutton's amendment up here. Senator Nespa wish to speak. Uh, which of you should we rock and roll with first? Okay. We Senator, should go with me, Mr. President. Say again? We should go with my question first, Mr. President. Really? Oh, well. But I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring my minority leader. Well, it's, uh, okay, well, it's great to have you here for your last day. That's uh, um, it. And, and the reason I said that, I think it's relevant for the, amended, the amendment that, uh, that the good senator from Bon Homme, Charles Mix Gregory in Tripp County is, grow, is, uh, is bringing. So, um, and the question, I just have a question for the chief, for the prime sponsor. State your question, thank you. Uh, you, you, is it true that you voted against this bill in committee? And if so, could you explain why? Uh, Senator Boland, do you wish to answer the question since it has no relevance to the amendment? Yes, I did. And I will just confess, it was a moment of weakness. We'll leave it at that. Good. Well, so I am confused, but I'm sure Senator Sutton will come uh, to the rescue. Senator Sutton, okay. you have a motion to amend. Mr. President, I do. 1006 Fox Trout Alpha, is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Move President. Move it at this time. I do. Comments on the motion to amend? Do you wish to speak to the bill as well? Yes, please. Granted. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the body. Uh, I bring this amendment to you because there was a lot of discussion in committee and a lot of concern about what could be perceived as a uh, blackout period that would be four and a half months, over four and a half months. And so this was simply an attempt to find some common ground, some compromise. We're essentially cutting off uh, 30 days of that blackout period. So you're still going to have that time from December 1st to March 1st plus the 15 days uh, to comply. And so this is simply an attempt to find some compromise on this. I think it's reasonable, and I don't think that... Uh, there would be near as much opposition if we could find some common ground on this. So it is my hope that uh, compromise is not dead in this body. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Remarks on the motion to amend? Uh, Senator Kurt. Thank you, Mr. President. As my esteemed colleague said, we did consider this in the State Affairs Committee, and I spoke against the amendment at that time, and I will do so again here today in the Senate chamber. There's nothing in House Bill 1006 in its current format that precludes the Legislative Research Council from providing their report at any point after it's been submitted. In fact, the Executive Director for the LRC, Mr. Hancock, was in attendance at the committee hearing, and we did discuss that measure at some length. Uh, he told us at that particular setting that 
the LRC works very diligently on all matters before it, but that the volume of work with pre-filed bills, the legislative session, and so on, require full time and attention by their staff to their primary responsibility, which is serving the state legislature. He said that they would work diligently on behalf of all constituent groups, including the public, to make sure that their work was done in a timely fashion, and that they would not hold things, if you will, at bay until the last possible moment and to release it then, but it was his opinion that it was best left to the format as left in 1006 so that they were held by statute to a reasonable time, but that they be able to prioritize their work during the legislative session to those of us that are here working on behalf of the people so that we can get our committee work done in an appropriate time, we can get our bills considered in each chamber in an appropriate time frame, and that they won't have their attention diverted during that time frame should the need so arise. I'm gonna ask you to resist the amendment, but house, pass House Bill 1006 in its unamended form. Thank you. Further remarks on Sutton's motion to amend? Hearing none, all those in favor of Senator Sutton's motion to amend HB Fox, excuse me, 1006 Foxtrot Alpha, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay? No. Motion fails. Further remarks on House Bill 1006 as unamended. Senator Nelson, welcome back. Thank you, sir. Question for the sponsor. Yes, sir. Please state your question. Thank you. Would any feedback that LRC provides those that are submitting these, these requests be made public? Senator Boland, do you care to answer the question? Excuse me, would you please restate that question? Sure. Any responses that LRC provides as far as feedback on any of these measures to these individual groups or persons, will that then be made public? I, I'm not sure as to the pr processes or procedures of the LRC in that regard. I would not know. I couldn't answer that question. Thank you, Senator Nelson. You have the floor, sir. Sure. Thank you, sir. Well, I, I do have that concern. Uh, our Legislative Research Council uh, is supposed to be nonpartisan, impartial. My concern is that uh, we're dragging them into situations where, uh, as we all know, issues can be very contentious. And uh, I'm concerned about the, the integrity of our process, our nonpartisan uh, Legislative Research Council. Uh, I've also got concerns about what some have written and, and perceived as delays in the process. Um, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit concerned we don't know going forward whether this information is going to be made to the public. Uh, I, I personally do not want, uh, or professionally, as far as a District 19 Senator, I do not want our LRC involved uh, in policy debates. It's not their place, they should not be involved, they're not the elected officials. Uh, that also goes pro or con on any of the issues that may come before them where voters groups are involved. So uh, with us not knowing that answer, whether uh, their opinions and their information they provide is gonna be made, made to the public, I'd be on the default of, of, of opposing this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Boland, do you wish to close? Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Very briefly, uh, and uh, in response to the first question I received from the good senator from District 15, I would uh, note that, uh, first of all, this bill needs to pass. I fully endorse the words of the uh, majority leader. Uh, and I also would note that the good senator from District 15 voted for this during the uh, summer session. So please in pass this bill in its present form. Thank you. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate's final passage of House Bill 1006. Those in favor of passage will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Frerichs? No. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? No. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? No. Killer? No. Plum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? No. Netherton is excused. Nordstrup 
it's excused. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? It's excused. Rush? Aye. Russell? No. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? No. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? No. Pardon? No. No. Wick? Aye. And yeah. Okay. Uh, Youngberg. No. Mr. President, Monroe. Mr. President, there are 21 yeas, 11 nays, and three excused. House Bill 1006, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any questions on the title? I approve the title then. House Bill 1019, an act to revise certain provisions regarding background checks for physicians and to declare an emergency. Thank you. House Bill 1019, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Thank you, Mr. Sarah President. Clum. House Bill 1019 is the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which was signed into law in 2015. It is an agreement between 22 states that, as of January 9th, 2018, that allows for expedited process for licensure for physicians. Um, 13 states have the authority to do criminal background investigations and to be a state of principal licensure. Seven states, including South Dakota, are unable to serve as a state of principal licensure, but are able to issue licenses based on those states that can be a state of principal licensure. South Dakota is not able to serve as a state of principal licensure for expedited license applicants because the criminal background state law 36-4-11.1 does not include the expedited licensure process. This proposed change will allow South Dakota to do a criminal background investigation for those applicants who want to have a South Dakota who want to have South Dakota as their state of principal licensure and participate in the IMLC expedited licensing process. Please vote yes. Further remarks. Hearing none, the question for the Senate is final passage of House Bill 1019. It does have an emergency clause. Requires two-thirds majority vote for passage. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Boland. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Tiller? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nessaba? Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 32 yeas, three excused. House Bill 1019, having received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. I approve the title as well. House Bill 1021, an act to revise certain provisions related to the practice of podiatry and to authorize certain free fee increases. House Bill 1021, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Are there any remarks? Well, good afternoon, Senator Soholt. Well, good afternoon, Mr. President. You know President. what? For your birthday, Monday, we're canceling session. Just Isn't for your birthday. I am so incredibly Just a grateful, happy birthday Mr. to President. you. I'm grateful and it's, feeling very special. I just want you to know the art of politics is taking credit for the inevitable. You're welcome. <laughs> Congratulations. Happy birthday. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Okay, House Bill 1021 was brought to the Health and Human Services Committee um, at the request of the Board of Podiatry Examiners. So if your feet are hurting, I want everyone to pay attention. All right, so um, the really this bill, House Bill 1021, 
has to do with cleanup language to their statutory act of how their practice runs. There's just a lot of style and form things and update to their practice act. But the crux of the change really comes in section 13 and 14 where it talks about increasing fees. So the Board of Podiatry functions under the Department of Health and our licensing boards are self-funded through the fees of their members. And they have not raised fees in 20 years and that's typically how the licensing boards do that. They raise the fees and they go for a long time drawing down in their balances. And for the last, I believe it's three years, they, three fiscal years, they have been steadily decreasing their cash position. And the Department of Health really requires that they would have at least $20,000 in reserve within the boards in case there's a contested case or someone that they need to investigate in relationship to safety for the people within their practice act. And as of fiscal year 17, they're sitting in a position of $23,811. So they need to raise their fees. I doubt they'll be back for a long time to do that again. There was no opposition in the committee meeting. The only reason that it is coming to the floor of the Senate is because it requires a two-thirds vote to pass this through because of the fee increase. I would stand by for any questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for the remarks. Hearing none, the question before the Senate is final passage of House Bill 21. As Senator Soholt, the birthday girl said, birthday woman said, uh, it requires two-thirds majority vote for passage. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? Aye. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Jensen? No. Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Nay. Nesaba? Aye. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Rush? Aye. Russell? No. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 29 yeas, 3 nays, and 3 excused. House Bill 1021, having re received a two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any questions on this title? Title is approved then. House Bill 1040, an act to provide for the licensing of a professional counselor, professional, professional counselor mental health or marriage and family therapist licensed in another state under certain circumstances and to declare an emergency. House Bill 1040, having received a second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Are there any remarks? Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I think this is appropriate for an individual who is just about to get married. Go ahead. Very much so. Uh, House Bill 1040 changes the option for the, board of, for the board to license an applicant who is licensed in another state as a professional counselor or professional counselor mental health for reciprocity, which is substantially similar requirements between the state of licensure in South Dakota to the endorsement licensing based on a valid license in another state under, circum under circum certain circumstances. The proposed change allows, uh, changes allow a professional counselor licensed in another state for at least three years and in good standing to be licensed in South Dakota upon passage of the national counselor examination and, a, and proof of an, a, of an active practice in the state where currently licensed. The proposed changes also allow a professional counselor mental health licensed in another state for at least five years and in good standing to be licensed in South Dakota upon passage of the National Counselor Examination passage, Examination. Passage of the National Clinical Mental Health Counselor Examination and proof of an active practice in the state where they're currently licensed. It's a good bill. I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks? Hearing none, the question before the Senate is final passage of House Bill 1040 has emergency clause, requires two-thirds majority vote for passage. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? No. Frerichs? Aye. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? Aye. Jensen? Aye. 
Kennedy? Aye. Killer? Aye. Klum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? Aye. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? Aye. Netherton? Excuse. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters is excused. Grush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Soholt? Aye. Solano? Aye. Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? Aye. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Mr. President, there are 31 yeas, one nay, and three excused. House Bill 1040, having received two-thirds majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any title questions? Titles approved. Last bill. Senate Bill 94, having had its second reading, is up for consideration and final passage. Remind everybody, it is amended already with uh, 94 Juliet Bravo. Senator Kobeck, let's pick up from where you're at. Uh, Mr. President? Okay. Point, point of uh, personal Would you privilege? like to speak? First, okay. Senator Kennedy, please. If I may, yeah. I want to apologize to the good senator from Minnehaha County and to the body. Uh, I misread the statute. The statute that I referenced had two parts. One part was when it was originally passed and in effect, uh, it, it covered a period of time through the 2011 school year. There's a subsequent portion of it that went into effect after that. The provision I was referring to was in the years prior to 2011. That provision's been removed in years subsequent to 2011. So I apologize for taking the body's time. I apologize for the good senator and making him run around and try to come up with an amendment that was unnecessary. Well, thank you. Um, we all run through those things, but just as we get through uh, these type of things, it's always easy to stand at ease or move these things around without creating a lot of hassles up here. I want you to know that. So thank you very much, Senator Kennedy. And Senator Kobeck, did you wish to add anything else to that? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, may I speak to the bill? Now to the bill, yes, sir. Okay, thank yep. you. As amended, thank you. I'll speak to the bill as amended, and I appreciate the comments from the, my good friend and Senator from the Yankton area, okay? Thank you. Uh, you guys probably all kind of wonder how I got involved with uh, this bill. Uh, this summer, oh, four or five months ago, I got a phone call from a, a mother and a young man, and uh, they wanted to sit down and, and talk about the Opportunity Scholarship Program, of which I did not know anything about uh, we sat down and had coffee, and I'm sitting with this young gentleman who's 17 years old and his mother. And this young gentleman uh, wanted to go to the school in the state of South Dakota, USD or SDSU, and he was telling me that he was homeschooled. And because he was homeschooled, he needed an ACT, which is American College Testing uh, Program, had needed a 28 in order to qualify for an opportunity scholarship from the state of South Dakota. His ACT at that point, and still is today, was over 25, and so he became uneligible for that scholarship. He, uh, in the course of this applying, he ended up applying down in Lincoln, Nebraska, and he received a scholarship from them of $52,000. Now, again, that is an out-of-state school. With talking to him and talking to his mother, they have a he had a sister who also did not qualify for this opportunistic opportunity scholarship as a homeschooler because her um, GPA, grade, or not grade point average, but her ACT was over 27. So she couldn't not qualify. She ended up going to Mary College in Bismarck, North Dakota, and she's a sophomore up there majoring in nursing, which would have been awful great to have her at South Dakota State majoring in nursing. So anyway, I said, what do we need to do to, to make this happen? The, the South Dakota Opportunity Scholarship was established in 2003 and instituted in 2004. The intent of the scholarship is to, one, encourage students to take a more rigorous course of study, two, to encourage high-achieving students to remain in the state 
proposed secondary education, and three, enhance the likelihood that those students would remain in the state after graduation to become of our work, part of our workforce. And we all talk about our workforce. Homeschool students were not eligible to receive the scholarship at all until 2013 when an alternate clause was enacted by law. According to state statute, in order to receive a scholarship, a public or non-public school student must score 28 on the ACT and complete specific course requirements. Currently, a homeschool student must score a 28 on the ACT to meet the parameters of the alternate clause. This is because the South Dakota Board of Regents does not recognize a homeschool's coursework and transcript as legitimate. The ACT test is the most popular college entrance exam accepted and the value by all universities and colleges in the United States. It is based on what students learn in high school. In South Dakota, of 37% of students scored a 24 and above, while only 13% scored a 28 or higher. This creates an unfair situation for students that are homeschooled. The intention of this bill is to match the requirements outlined in state statute for public, private, and homeschool students, which is a 24 on the ACT, and to complete the required courses. The bill does not add or subtract anything that is not required by law for all other students in the state. The opponents of this bill, if there are any, might argue about the GPA. This is not required by statute and was added into administrative rule by the Board of Regents. The, color, the colored graph which I handed out, if you all want to take a quick look at it, Display statistics from the South Dakota Board of Regents school transition dashboard on their own website. It compares homeschool students who entered a South Dakota public university to all other South Dakota public and non-public school students. According to the South Dakota Board of Regents, students who graduate from a homeschool are performing well in the South Dakota public universities. Again, I'll repeat that. Students who graduate from a home school are performing well in the South Dakota public universities. For the years 2013 through 2016, homeschool students had higher ACT scores by close to two whole points on the cumulative score and higher or equal across all sub scores, as you can see on the graphs. Homeschool students are showing up to college ready to take on the coursework. Many take dual credit before college and the chart shows that they don't have to take remedial coursework or prerequisite coursework as often as the rest of the freshman population coming from the public and private schools. After the first year, homeschool students had more completed credit and a significantly higher GPA. Homeschool students would not show clear evidence of, excuse me, homeschool students would not show clear evidence of successful performance on the ACT and the other statistics noted if they were not college and career ready. To boost enrollment at the state schools, we are offering in-state tuition rates to residents in Nebraska, Minnesota, and Iowa who must only meet the minimum accepted requirements and ACT of 18 or 21 and are rewarded with reduced in-state tuition rate. This is not an issue of fairness for all workforce development, but many of our best and brightest students are leaving our state. The cost of this bill is minimal. According to the statistics available from the Department of Education and the Board of Regents, the increase is just a few students. The legislature always finds the number of students who enter the program, always funds the number of students who enter the program without an appropriation bill each year. This isn't a cap on the funds and all eligible students who apply are awarded the scholarship. So as you can see, this bill is a bill on its own. The Board of Regents put administrative rules in the bill in 2004 and it talks about the GPA. Homeschooled children, the GPA is not accepted 
because they probably don't believe or understand that these homeschooled children are well qualified to go on to our state schools. Just a reminder, there are three legal ways recognized by the state of South Dakota for parents to choose to educate their children, public, private, and homeschool. These are parallel and no one and no one way gets to lay their criteria over the other. The question sometimes is asked, will parents assign grades that the student didn't earn? I'm just gonna say this, would we all agree that Medicaid fraud is an issue? Should we get rid of Medicaid because a few people aren't honest? Why punish everyone for the hypothetical case further if a parent is found to have perjured a student's transcripts? We have laws that deal with that. Let's try to keep our best performing kids in the state. I will stand by for further questions. I would appreciate your support on Senate Bill 94. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks, Senator Sohol. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I rise in opposition to Senate Bill 94, but not for the intent of what the bill is about, but for the intent of what we need to consider as this body for the scope of changing the administrative rule in relationship to the Opportunity Scholarship. Now, I think this, the previous legislators that put this in place were really looking at, well, how much can we afford to do? How much of the Opportunity Scholarship can we provide to students within our state? And where are we at in relationship to retaining students as a workforce? And so the administrative rule went into play that the coursework, which is in Senate Bill 94, along with the ACT of, of 24, yes, that is true that statutorily, 94 plus what is in current statute for public and private school would be a level playing field. But because of the economic implications of every single student that achieved, went through that coursework and got a 24 on an ACT, that would lead to many, many more students within the state of South Dakota getting the Opportunity Scholarship, which probably is not a bad thing. I mean, I'm very supportive that if we're gonna move in this direction, then we need to move in this direction for all children. So what transpired is that the GPA of 3.0 plus the, um, the certain a C grade in every one of those courses was also a requirement. So if we took off those components in administrative rule for all of our public and private students, if we s followed the premise of the good senator from Minnehaha County that the ACT outcome of 24, and I don't doubt that that's you know, reasonable and right, that would open up the Opportunity Scholarship for many more students in the state of South Dakota, which also is probably a money well invested by this legislature in our future brightest kids, keep them in the state, keep them in school, probably one of the best workforce development things that we could think about doing. But the economic reality of that, if we open it up to 24, taking that coursework and a 24 ACT, so the playing field is exactly the same for public, private, homeschool. Doesn't matter where your entry point is, which I'm not disputing is probably where we have evolved to. Over the four year period of time of commitment to those students would be an additional almost 1.3 million. It's 1.296. When you look at the children that currently have a 24 ACT, take that coursework, now, kids that don't meet that C grade or the 3.0 GPA, they also have to meet that threshold of a 28 ACT. So it wasn't just the homeschool students that had to do that. And so it was some, now, to the good senator's point of, are people lying on transcripts and being nefarious and whatever, I think it was more that it was trying to put in an objective playing field, that there is criteria of how your grades and your transcripts roll forward from an objective person, not your family member. And that's not meant in any disrespect. I'm just merely speaking the, the thinking that was probably happening in the state. So I reluctantly am in opposition to 94, and it would be greatly misinterpreted that my no vote is because I do not want children who are homeschooled to get the Opportunity Scholarship. Nope, 
I think it would be great if they would. But what I don't want us to do is now, because of this bill, create an unlevel playing field again. And by doing a right, we now have another wrong. And that we would have to give clear direction and fiduciary obligation to assure that we could remove all those parameters in administrative rule so that every child was treated right through the Opportunity Scholarship and that we would be sincere about investing into our brightest and our best. I would be very supportive of us looking for a way to do that, of working with our appropriations colleagues to come up with something that seems like a reasonable criteria for all children within the state of South Dakota to get that Opportunity Scholarship, to go to our public and private schools within the state of South Dakota, and to retain them as our future bright workforce. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Heinert, Matakipi. Matakipi, Mr. President. Well, I just, I have a question for the prime sponsor. State your question, please. Um, on page one of the bill, line six, and we amended this in committee. Uh, when we first saw it, it said shall, and we amended it to may also, and then list these criteria. Is it, is it your belief now that with that may in there, they wouldn't have to meet these criteria? Senator Kovac, do you care to answer the question? Thank you, Senator. I appreciate the question. The reason that we went from uh, to may shall is because of the criteria that is taught differently in public private schools and in the home schools. And this criteria that you see listed there, that is a requirement that is in the original statute of the bill that was originally in 2004, but amended in, in 2011, as a good senator from Yankton had said. Yes, they would be required to take those courses, plus have the required ACT score to qualify for the Opportunity Scholarship. Thank you. You have the floor, Follow, sir. follow, follow up? up? Yes, sir. state your question. Um, Senator, has, has you approached the Board of Regents on changing their administrative rule? Senator Colbeck, do you wish to answer the question? To answer that question, I have not approached them on that administrative rule, but in testimony, if you listen to the testimony of the gentleman from the Board of Regents, they were interested in, in looking at that administrative rule, if you remember what all the testimony was, okay? Thank you. Senator Heinert, you have the floor. Okay, well, I would just remind the body, if you look at the bill as it, as it reads right now, it says, may also be a resident of South Dakota. That doesn't say shall be a resident of South Dakota. It said it may be a resident of South Dakota. Um, the criteria listed that the good senator talked about does not match the criteria that public and private schools students have to go through. This could have been handled way better, way easier, if they would have approached the Board of Regents and said, will you include homeschool students at the 24 ACT level? Then it's fair, then it matches. Because right now, we do not match. This gives a carve out to homeschool students that don't have to meet the same criteria that our private and public school students do. And the, and the one last thing, why well, I, I sit on this committee and I got all of the information from the Board of Regents and from the parents. Um, we had two, in 2016, we had 225 homeschool students, uh, seniors. And their average score was 25.3, I believe. Uh, it, was, it was over the 24 threshold. We dropped this to 24 for them, which is fine. I'm fine with that. If we even it all out, I'm fine with that. But that could have a huge financial impact on this state if more kids are eligible. And we have not had one conversation about where that money comes from, who is going to, who's gonna pay for it, what other program 
it gets sucked out of. So I think we could have done this better at administrative rule. I think at least we should have sent this to appropriations to talk about it and get a, a fiscal impact statement on it. So I can't support it as it is right now, especially with that May in there. Pilamia. Pilamia. Senator Tiedemann, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members of the body. Again, I support the passion and the concept that the good senator from Minnehaha and Lincoln County is bringing. He's concerned about those students that didn't meet the criteria. I was concerned when my son didn't meet the criteria to get the presidential scholarship in Lincoln, Nebraska, but he still went to school there. I think there's more to this, and I want to talk about the process. The process, I support the policy, but what I have a hard time with is not bringing it to appropriations to be put on the same playing field of all the bills that we look at that are spending, especially when we're looking at spending general funds. I support the fact that it's going to keep in that criteria. At first, I thought that was coming out because one of the greatest benefits of the Opportunity Scholarship was not just giving the dollars to the students, was that we helped change the criteria and the curriculum in the school systems so that they were better prepared for the college. And so that's, for that reason, I'll probably vote no on this bill, mainly because I think it's skirting the process. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Monroe, good afternoon. God bless you, Senator Stalzer. Good afternoon, Mr. President. I've heard it said four different times now that the amount of money, the $20,000 or what, however many thousand dollars it was, it's not a very big amount when you consider the budget we're dealing with and the numbers we throw around every day, but that this number is more important in keeping people who score, score far, far higher than is required and far higher than the norm on these tests. Uh, I see. I, I don't see any reason that 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 the money should be the problem. It's a, it, if if anything makes sense to me, it's to level the level the playing field. That's what everybody's talking about here. Level the playing field. Make the score. Decide how many kids every year are at or above the score. Make that the score, and it doesn't matter if they come from a public or a private or alternative school then that's where the score is. That then we have our, the right number of students. It doesn't have to go to appropriations. And uh, I think the process now is just fine. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Monroe. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. If I could draw the uh, body's attention to that one handout, it's a plain white handout that has all these different uh, numbers uh, relating to how many students, homeschool students, how many uh, public school students are involved in these scholarships. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, before I get started any further, I'd like to ask, um, well, I'm sorry, let me back up. In 2016, you'll see on this sheet, there were 52 public school kids in 2016 who were added to the scholarship program you take 52 students times $6,500, you're looking at $338,000. Now, my question for any of the appropriators that would like to answer this, do you know if there was a fiscal note requested in 2016 regarding this expenditure? Thank you. Further remarks? Senator Russell. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I, I want to thank my colleague from Minnehaha County for his efforts in regard to this legislation. Uh, he came here, this, he's in his uh, freshman term as a state senator, and he, we here today witnessed uh, quite a gargantuan effort. And, um, I want to commend him for his good humor, his good sense of fairness, and his desire to 
um, make South Dakota and this institution a better place. I, I, I greatly uh, admire what he's gone through today. I wish that I could have helped a little bit more if I would have been faster on the draw to grab that law book, et cetera. But with that being said uh, about my admiration of his basic sense of fairness, we had, um, we had some discussion about the sincerity uh, of some of the opposition and the procedure that um, uh, my good friend has gone through today uh, and uh, the lack of procedure that some of the opposition has, has uh, voiced in reference to his efforts to get this passed. Um, This is, a, this is a matter of, of basic fairness. And that is, is that we have a standard of 28 on the ACT for those students that, uh, in my district, sometimes it's they're very rural. They, they live in a very rural setting. And therefore, their parents have made the the, the choice, and, and it can't be easy to homeschool those folks uh, because they want to give them the best opportunity they can and not put maybe, you know, seven-year-old children on a bus at 6.30 in the morning or maybe even earlier. And so I respect the right of those parents to make a determination that's best for their children at that age. And I understand that this is, this uh, it, it may end up, you know, that you're, you go all the way through 12 years and, and maybe are, are homeschooled that entire time for whatever reason that family deems uh, important. And I, I think that it's important that we honor and we respect the decisions of the people in our country to make these kind of decisions. But this bill, the, the thing that, that has bothered me about this for some time is, is that you have a standard on those people that have, that have made this life choice for their family that they have to achieve in order to get the benefits of all of, that everyone in the state has paid for. All, all the homeschool families, they pay their taxes. They may not benefit from the local school but they should be able to benefit in an equal way to the rest of the people in, of the state of South Dakota who also pay taxes. Now, I've never had anyone, as far as I know, in my family in South Dakota for a number of, this would be the fifth generation, that has not gone to, through public education. But I feel that when I pay the taxes that those other individuals pay, that my children should not be at an advantage to only require a 24 on the ACT, but yet another family in my same community who's made a choice um, that they believe is beneficial to their children that they would then be required to achieve a 28 on the ACT. And then we would reward an agency of state government for putting in administrative rules that would thereafter be utilized for a sincere debate here on the floor of the state senate to say, you aren't uh, you, you aren't qualified unless you receive a 28 on the ACT because we put in these administrative rules as they apply to public school students. That, that in my mind is, is uh, the Department of Education by administrative rule giving an advantage to those students who attend the public schools. So when I see, when I see what's going on here today, 
um, I have to rise and I have to support the good senator from Sioux Falls in his effort to try and extract basic fairness in the system. A basic sense of fairness that some student doesn't have to achieve a, 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 a set against everyone else in the state of so much higher as a percentage against all the other students in the state. And I would hope that we can see that. I, I understand the good senator from Todd County having a concern about May versus shall. I just wish that he would have made that concern noted to the good senator, the good freshman senator that, uh, that's doing his best to be sincere in his efforts to move legislation forward that simply would make things fair for all the taxpayers of the state of South Dakota. So with that, I ask you in good conscience to look closely at what's being done here and reward uh, the efforts uh, that are, in my mind, noble and should have been fostered or maybe some of us people that had been around here a while, maybe help them out a little bit, uh, rather than bedevil with questions that are designed, in my mind, uh, to scuttle a very good and a very fair way of going about business for the state of South Dakota. And with that, I thank you so much for your attention to this issue and your your patience with me as I struggle here today uh, to do what I think would be obviously the fair thing to do. Thank you. Further remarks? <clears throat> Senator Tapio. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have a question for the prime sponsor. State your question. Uh, my question is, uh, do all people who apply for this scholarship, are they accepted if they uh, have a uh, ACT test over 24 from a public school? And do all people that are uh, homeschooled uh, that achieve a 28 or higher get accepted for this? Senator Colbeck, do you care to answer the question? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator from Watertown, South Dakota. The criteria in this bill, this is, would be that both public, private, and homeschooled children that met the criteria of a 24 ACT score and the criteria of the courses listed on there, the criteria of taking those courses would qualify them for the Opportunity Scholarship. That would include any students that would do that. Just some facts, I just want to clarify some things with you and the rest of the body. 37% of the graduating class it, with ACT, 37% have 24 or more. Okay? Of that particular amount, 8% go on to a higher form of education. So we're not talking about a, a large number of people that would probably qualify for this opportunity scholarship. Senator Colbeck, yeah. just a second. Senator Tapio, wasn't your question whether or not individuals who met the criteria, if they meet the criteria under the current law, is it funded? Not what would happen under this bill? Okay. So to restate the question, it's do you know that is everybody who meets the criteria now that's established, whether homeschooled or, uh, or private or public, are they funded regardless of the amount of funds that are available? If they apply for the scholarship, that would be correct. Great. You have the floor, Senator Tapio. Okay. Uh, I, 
I share the concerns of uh, the senator from West River that um, talked about the very inherent unfairness of, of two different standards for a homeschool uh, children versus um, public schools. I think there's a couple of other issues. There's a process issue about whether or not we went to the Appropriations Committee, uh, whether or not that's appropriate. Uh, and then I think there's a, there's a question of whether or not it, it actually uh, increases the, the expense to the state and do we need a fiscal note. Uh, so I believe those three issues, whether it's fair, uh, did we go through the right process, and have we uh, discussed uh, appropriately what the cost of the state. The reason I ask the question of if everybody that attains the, the list of uh, uh, requirements with all of the uh, uh, course uh, selection as well as they reached in public schools over 24 ACT and in um, you know home schools uh, over 28 if they all were funded then we have no idea exactly what we're going to spend every year and I don't I, I, it seems like that's a, a, a arbitrary number going up and down every year what I would suggest is that we would maybe uh, look at trying to create a certain amount for a fund and then create a sliding standard that everybody applies over the, the level of 24 and maybe 28 or you know bring that down to 24. But then once the, the money runs out on based on who receives the highest and then the people that are at the low end do not receive funds uh, for the scholarship or some other alternative. But, I'm in generally support of the, the, the senator. I just wanted to work through that, uh, the body, with that idea. Thank you. Uh, senator Nelson, you haven't spoken on this before. And then uh, Jensen and Senator Kobach, let me explain. You'll get the opportunity to closing. I did wish to sound curt. Senator Nelson, you have the floor, please. Thank you, sir. I also want to rise in support of my, my good and gentle, kind colleague from Lincoln and Minnehaha County. And I want to express a very loud, well done, sir. This is exactly what South Dakotans expect from their legislative process. And I want to express my 100% concurrence and support. This is exactly where this issue is supposed to be, is right here in this hallowed body. South Dakotans elect us to deal with these type of problems and situations. And in regards to the comments that this should have been brought to the Board of Regents, I'd like to point out to the many South Dakotans who have, have struggled under this problem, that it has been brought to the Board of Regents. It's now here in your hands. And South Dakotans understand fairness. This bill addresses a gross unfairness. And we talk about unlevel playing fields. My first year up here, I wanted to bring a bill to give tax relief to those who educate their children by homeschooling them or private education. And these kind South Dakotans said, listen, we're willing to sacrifice. The money's not important. All we want to do is to be left alone so we can educate our kids properly as per our parental rights. Out of respect for them, I withdrew the bill. But to this day, I am also moved as my good colleague from Lincoln and Minnehaha County was about how unfair it is. Here we are, we have held these, these wonderful, wonderful South Dakotans to a unfair standard, not a standard, but unfair criteria. The objective standard is the HCT score. That is what our colleges go by. Now, instead of respecting the sacrifices and the savings to the state of South Dakota that these homeschooling families make, realize not only do they pay their taxes which support our public schools, they don't burden our public schools with their children. They homeschool them. And instead of showing that the respect it deserves, the deference and reward that, that amazing parenting dedication and sacrifices, we're going to punish their children even further? Folks, come on, that's, I, it is so unfair. I can tell you how unfair it is. When the good senator from Lincoln and Minnehaha County talked with me about this, he almost moved this old Marine to tears because it was so emotional to him. 
It was so grossly unfair to his being that he was tearing up. And if it doesn't make you tear up, I'd ask you to re-examine this issue. We talk about the lack of revenue and that this should have went through appropriations. Absolutely, positively not. This is the appropriate forum for this. We should not be deferring things to appropriations to decide wholeheartedly on our behalf. We do not have a revenue problem, South Dakota. We have a priority and spending problem. I'm here to tell you that this is a priority in spending for me and my constituents I represent. And it should be to you. I'd ask you to have a moment, if you ever see young George Dennert from the Aberdeen area, take a moment to talk with this homeschooled young man. I gotta tell you, if he's the future of South Dakota, you better start wearing shades, because that kid's brilliant. To further expound on how brilliant these homeschoolers are, there is a legislator over in the House that started here as a homeschooling page. That page, when I met him, knew more about South Dakota politics, more about the bills we were dealing with than the vast majority of my colleagues in the legislature. This is the best of the best of South Dakota, and we should be supporting that, holding it up, and helping them pursue their dreams and giving them a level playing field to do so because so far we haven't done that. Folks, support the good gentleman's bill. This is a good common sense and proper adjustment to the statute, 24 for everybody. Thank you. Does anybody wish to speak before Senator Jensen speaks the second time? Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I would just like to clarify a couple of things. Uh, there's been a lot of talk here, a lot of fingers pointing in this direction and that direction, blaming the border regions, blaming people for certain things. We're here because of something the legislature did in 2013. In 2013, this legislature enacted what's now codified as 1355.31.2. And I'll read the relevant portion of it. Any student who does not meet the high school course requirements as provided in subdivision 135531 subpart 3 is eligible for the opportunity scholarship if, one, the student takes the test administered by the American College Testing Program and earns a composite score of 28 or higher, et cetera, et cetera. This, is, this isn't anybody's blame but ours. And I think what the good senator is trying to do today is deal with the first sentence of what we passed in 2013 and say, okay, Homeschool students, if they take the curriculum that's laid out in code, now can qualify for an opportunity scholarship just like a student that goes through the public school system. That's the reason I asked the question early on today, because I thought the attempt was to try to make it exactly the same. Same curriculum in the public school, same curriculum in the homeschool. And I, after I realized my error in reading. I think that's been accomplished in this bill. So I think what the good senator is doing today with Senate Bill 94 is just recognizing what was established by this legislature in 2013. If you meet those course requirements, those course standards, then you're entitled to apply on a 24 ACT. If you don't, you gotta do a 28. I'm still not certain how I will vote on the bill because I am concerned about the fact that there's no fiscal note. I'm not concerned about the fact it didn't go through appropriations, but I do think a fiscal note would have been helpful. But I think we need to be clear, this isn't something that's being manipulated by the Board of Regents. We set this up, it's back in our hands, we can deal with it one way or the other. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, does anybody, Senator Partridge? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. President, excuse me. Um, I think the good senator from Watertown had a great comment related to this being categorized in three areas, fairness, process, and cost. I wholeheartedly disagree with the good senator from Bonham who says that we don't need to go through the appropriations process. I'm gonna stand up for our appropriators who work very hard throughout the session to try to figure out where to pay for this and how to figure it out. In our budget right now, uh, I wanted to discuss the Board of Regents as well because they're getting thrown under the bus as well here. The Board of Regents actually asked for over $10 million of scholarship, some of it being the opportunity, some being needs-based. Governor's recommendation is closer to about $7 million, but that's still an increase of over $600,000 for scholarships next year. So the Board of Regents and what we then appropriate will be considerably more. Now, if this bill goes through, it's gonna be nearly $700,000 of increase. So the question from an appropriation standpoint, which is extremely valid, how do we pay for it? Where does it come from? <coughs> I'm not happy that this did not go through the proper process and that the appropriations committee was not consulted. But I am gonna ask for your support on this bill because I think we'll see it again in appropriations. I think we'll deal with this after it comes from the House and comes back into joint appropriations and we'll work on this as to exactly what it will entail. We'll, we'll actually ask the House or somehow figure out a way to get it in front of us because we are gonna figure out how to, ha how to spend the money, how to come up with that money if we really feel like we want to. So that's where I think we ought to go today is in support of the bill and in hopes and ex expectation that it comes through joint appropriations again, of which we will give it the proper hearing and merit. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody wish to speak before Senator Jensen speaks a second time? Okay, Senator Jensen, and then it looks like we'll go to you, Senator Kolbeck, for your rebuttal, sir. Senator Jensen. Question for the uh, seasoned uh, appropriator from Brookings County. <clears throat> State your question. Do you know if there was a fiscal note requested in 2016 regarding the expenditure of the 52 students that were scholarship participators in 2016? Senator Tiedemann, do you care to answer the question? Mr. President, I'll try and answer his question. Typically, we look at bills that come forward that have dollars in them. You don't need a fiscal note then because you're asking for a specific amount of dollars. When you look at the general bill, which is also the spending bill for the state, there's no fiscal note needed because the exact dollar amount is there as to what it's going to cost. Senator Jensen, you have the floor, sir. Follow up. Please, State your question. Please. Was there an amount appropriated for uh, those 52 additional students? Senator, Je <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Tiedemann, do you care to answer the question? Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for the question. I don't know for certain. I don't have the paper in front of me to tell me that. But typically, how they have run it in the past when they estimate the number of students, whether they're going to private school, tech schools, or the universities, then there is a dollar amount there, and it's in the general bill. Senator Jensen, you have the floor. Thank you for the answer. <clears throat> Based on moving homeschool kids to 24 on their ACT test score from 28 would add a maximum of 12 students and you take that times 6,500, you're looking at $70,000. That's it, maximum. And that number 12, that number is based on LRC estimates. Maximum, 12 students, maybe 70,000 max. So, you know, this is not a, an issue that 
that we should even be dealing with as far as appropriations is concerned in my book because it certainly wasn't necessary when there was 338,000 uh, that had to be dealt with uh, to provide for the 52 public school students. So I would encourage this body to uh, support uh, this bill. I would also like to point out the financial benefit to the state of keeping the students here instead of going somewhere to Nebraska or Iowa, or Minnesota, keep them in our state. Let them spend their money here. Let them raise a family here. Let them have a career here. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Colbeck, you're closing. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, body, for the, the great discussion on this bill. And I'm, I wanna apologize if I kept any of you guys from happy hour tonight. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate I appreciate, really I do, I appreciate the, your willingness to work with me, you guys that worked with me, and you women that worked with me, and, and you that, that have given me some advice on this bill. I just want you to know that I think the investment, the investment in the state of South Dakota to our young people by adopting this bill so the homeschool children can also attend our public schools and get back into our workforce would be very important for our state of South Dakota. I do not like to see young students, young people leaving our state. Once they leave our state, they do not not necessarily come back here to work. So with that being said, I would appreciate your vote and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Further remarks, hearing no further remarks, the question before the Senate is final passage of Senate Bill 94 is amended. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed nay. Madam Secretary, call the roll. Senator Bolin. Aye. Kamak? Aye. Cronin? Aye. Kurd? Aye. Ewing? No. Brariks? No. Greenfield? Aye. Haverly? Aye. Heinert? No. Jensen? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Cardin? Aye. Killers? Plum? Aye. Kobeck? Aye. Langer? Aye. Mahar? No. Monroe? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Nesaba? Uh. Netherton's excuse. Otten? Aye. Partridge? Aye. Peters? Rush? Aye. Russell? Aye. Soholt? No. Solano? Stalzer? Aye. Sutton? Aye. Tapio? Aye. Tiedemann? No. White? Aye. Wick? Aye. Youngberg? Aye. Nesaba? Aye. Mr. President, there are 25 yeas, 6 nays, and 4 excused. Senate Bill 94, as amended, having received a majority vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. Any questions on the title? Title's approved. Uh, I have to sign some bills here, so we'll do uh, uh, announcements to start with. Any announcements for Tuesday? Announcements? Senator Bolin. Thank you. Um, we had an uh, education meeting today, and we're back at it on Tuesday. And uh, on Tuesday will be Tech School Day. We're going to be hearing from the uh, hearing of the nominations of uh, the people to the new tech board. And if we have any time left, we'll have a presentation from the uh, leaders of the tech, school, uh, tech schools here in South Dakota. So 745 on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kamak. Uh, Senate Ag will have no meeting on Tuesday. No meeting. Any other announcements? Senator Wick, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Appropriations will be hearing from the Board of Regents on Monday or Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. We love to see you down there to learn some more. Thank you. Any other announcements? Senator Russell. Senate Judiciary will meet at 8 a.m. on Tuesday. Thank you. Any other announcements? Senator Heinert. Uh, Corrections Commission will be meeting on Monday at 4 p.m. here in the Capitol. Corrections Commission here Monday? Okay. Be safe. Buckle up. President signing an act to revise certain references regarding the contractor's excise tax. That's Senate Bill 57.
President signing an act to revise certain provisions referring to the statements on auditing standards utilizing the Department of Revenue. That's 1,048. President signing an act to revise certain references to the Internal Revenue Code 1049. Not a too bad that wasn't 1040. President signing an act to revise certain provisions regarding the collection of motor fuel tax uh, from uh, interstate fuel users. That's 1068. Motion to adjourn. Senator Soholt moves that the Senate do now adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. As opposed, nay. Motion carried. We are adjourned. Be safe. We want you back. Thank you, ladies.